Welcome to the Radical Truth Podcast. I am your host, Glenn Meldrum, and this podcast is brought to you by In His Presence Ministries. Visit us on the web at www.ihpministry.com. We close our last lesson just beginning to dig into what Peter said to his fellow disciples in the upper room after they returned to Jerusalem from seeing Jesus ascend into heaven. In verses 15 through 17 of the first chapter of Acts, we are told, In those days Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers, the scriptures had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through the mouth of David concerning Judas, who served as guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in this ministry. There were 11 apostles left out of the original 12, because Judas was dead, and we will look at this in a moment. Peter thought it was necessary to fill that empty position and was going to suggest having the opening immediately filled. Peter, continuing to talk about the need to fill Judas' empty place, said in verse 18, With the reward he got for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong, his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. The reward Judas got for betraying Jesus was 30 pieces of silver and an eternity in hell. The 30 pieces of silver doesn't make a man rich. It was barely enough to buy a slave in that day. So Judas sold Jesus to the Pharisees and chief priests for the price of a slave. After Judas betrayed Jesus, he had betrayer's regret and wanted to undo the damage he had done, but it was too late. He confessed to the chief priests that he had sinned by betraying innocent blood, and all they said in return was, That's your responsibility. Exasperated over the situation, he threw the thirty pieces of silver down in the temple and went out and hanged himself. Judas had worldly sorrow that leaves people hopeless. Only godly sorrow that brings repentance and reconciliation with God offers true hope. Judas was sorry that he had betrayed Jesus, whom he knew was innocent of any crime, but he refused to repent and be saved. We are told in Matthew chapter 27, verses 6 through 8, The chief priest picked up the coins and said, It is against the law to put this into the treasury since it is blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why it has been called the field of blood to this day. What an interesting act to use that blood money to purchase a cemetery for Gentiles or non-Jews. Though the chief priest didn't understand what they were doing, This was a prophetic act, showing that the Gentiles would come into faith through the blood of Christ. Their act was also a fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy given to Jeremiah the prophet, declaring, They took the thirty silver coins, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field, as the Lord commanded me. How astounding! Even Jesus' persecutors and murderers were part of fulfilling what the Lord proclaimed would happen. In Matthew chapter 27, we are told that Judas hanged himself, but what Dr. Luke wrote sounds more like he threw himself off of a cliff. There isn't a contradiction between what Matthew and Luke wrote. They actually complement each other. Judas hanged himself, but while he was hanging, the rope broke and his body was torn asunder, as Luke described. Then in verse 19, we learn that everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that field the field of blood. The reason why everybody heard about Judas' death is because they learned how he betrayed Jesus. It was the news about Jesus that caused the account of Judas' suicide to become commonly known. Peter continued his proposal in verse 20, For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. Peter is quoting from Psalms chapter 69 verse 25 and Psalms 109 verse 8. Both of these psalms were originally spoken against King David's enemies, but they carry a secondary meaning as they apply to Messiah. It's interesting that Peter had quickly become an expert in the Old Testament and was able to quote from memory these verses. This knowledge probably came through the times Jesus shared with the disciples after his resurrection on the prophecies concerning Messiah's first coming. The Lord gave those disciples a supernatural gift to know God's Word so that they could effectively and correctly preach it. 
The point of the two prophecies is to show how Judas forfeited his God-given position through his betrayal of Messiah and that his place would be given to another. Peter was using these two verses to support his proposal to immediately replace Judas. The King James Version translates the position Judas held as a bishopric, which is a terrible translation. A more accurate translation is overseer or superintendent, which is basically what an apostolic calling consists of. An overseer is just that, one who oversees the spiritual life of the church or a number of churches in a given area. These ancient overseers had the care and oversight of different congregations. They would travel to the churches under their care to preach, teach, settle disputes, and enforce discipline when necessary. They also guarded the churches from false doctrines and false teachers. This is nothing like the modern idea of a bishop that's seen in some Protestant denominations. And this certainly is nothing like the denomination where bishops wear expensive religious clothes and horrendously ugly hats that look like a huge pistachio that split open on top. Anyway, in verses 21 and 22, Peter continued his speech. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become witness with us of his resurrection. The reasoning Peter is using for picking a replacement apostle is good, while the qualifications are unique since they can only relate to the ministry of the original twelve apostles. The ministry of the apostle didn't stop with the twelve or end with their death. Paul is clear proof of this, and there are other apostles that are mentioned in the New Testament as well. Let's take a few moments and look at the two unique qualifications Peter put before the gathered disciples. First, the man to fill Judas's forfeited position had to have been with Jesus throughout his ministry years, beginning with John's baptism. This refers to Jesus' baptism by John the baptizer. But here are some challenges on how Jesus began gathering disciples. It seems that after Jesus was baptized by John, he went into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil for 40 days. Immediately after this spiritual confrontation where Jesus left as absolute victor, he began gathering disciples. Remember, the candidate to fulfill the position of the twelfth apostle had to have first-hand knowledge of the entire ministry years of Jesus. He must be a credible eyewitness. The first priority of Christ's ministry was to gather around him disciples, which is something more than mere students seeking a religious education. As disciples, Jesus was out to mold their character, teach them the truths of the kingdom of God, and make them eyewitnesses of all that he taught and did. In Peter's speech, he was giving a general time frame that refers to the beginning of our Lord's ministry. When Jesus was baptized by John, he hadn't gathered to himself any disciples. After gathering a large number of disciples, the Lord chose from among them twelve men whom he called apostles. We don't know exactly when Jesus chose the twelve, but it must have been a little while after he began performing miracles. The Gospels concentrate upon the twelve and briefly speaks to the seventy-two disciples that he sent out to preach the good news, heal the sick, and cast out devils. How many men were eligible to fill Judas' position according to the standard mentioned by Peter we don't know, but more than likely there wasn't many. The second qualification is that the man would have had to seen the resurrected Savior and his ascension into heaven. The importance of this criterion Peter clearly stated for he must become a witness with us of Christ's resurrection. In the infant years of the newly born church, it was imperative that there were adequate witnesses to testify to our Lord's death, resurrection, and ascension. In Jewish court, there had to be at least two witnesses to convict a person of a crime or to make a legal transaction. The eleven apostles wanted another witness to verify the truth of Christ's resurrection so that there could be no doubt about it actually happening. The powerful witness these twelve men had would only influence those who wanted to know the truth. Those who reject the truth wouldn't believe the testimony of over 500 people who saw the resurrected Savior ascend into heaven. The King James Version translated verse 22 this way, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. The word ordained in this translation is totally misleading since that's not what the verse says in Greek. 
This is a completely unwarranted insertion into the text for the sole purpose to support the ecclesiastical idea of a formal ordained priesthood, but the New Testament doesn't teach such a thing. The New Testament promotes the priesthood of all believers, and there's absolutely no biblical support for a remake of the Old Testament priesthood that was limited to only a few people from the tribe of Levi and the family of Aaron. The Greek word simply means witness, and this is where we get the word martyr. The word martyr has come to refer to those who have died for the cause of Christ, but the word was not originally used in that way. Peter is saying that the man who fills Judas' position must be a witness for Christ, whether by life or death, whether through persecution or in times of peace. As the persecution of the church grew, the word martyr came to refer to those who died for Christ, and then they called those who were persecuted but not killed confessors. Nonetheless, the word martyr still means in Greek a witness, and every follower of Jesus is to be a martyr in this sense. According to Peter's recommendation, we read the disciples' response in verse 23. So they proposed two men, Joseph called Barsabas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. My thought is that if there were more possibilities, then they would have added to the list. But like I said earlier, Peter's proposal had only two criteria, and they were so narrow that only a couple of people were eligible. We know nothing of substance about either of the men. There are some traditions about them, but they are so contradictory that it's not worth the effort for me to even mention them. After Peter made his proposal and the two brothers were picked to be chosen between, verse 24 tells us what comes next. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry which Judas had left to go where he belongs. I see from this a grave error that's far too easy for us to repeat, and it would be good for us to take note of it so that we don't make the same error. Notice how the events transpired. First, Peter makes his proposal. Then there must have been some discussion over the matter, and then the people chose two potential men who could fill the position of the twelfth apostle. It was only after they had finished making all their plans that they decided to pray. And as we will see in a moment, they cast lots to know God's will, and I have to think that they didn't learn this from Jesus. After Peter made his initial proposal, they should have immediately went into prayer to learn God's will in the matter. Instead, they made their choice and then asked God to bless their decision. That's not how it's supposed to be done. If they had first gone to prayer and sought the Lord's will, they would have never had to use the casting of lots to make a decision for them. Here was a time for the apostles to lead and not resort to the casting of lots to determine what they thought was God's will. There are so many accounts in Scripture of how the absence of prayer or its lack has caused the downfall of many. In verse 26 we are told, Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, so he was added to the eleven apostles. In my opinion, casting lots isn't the way we should seek to know God's will in our life or the life of the church, since we don't see this as a New Testament practice. There are, however, some examples in the Old Testament of casting lots to get an answer from God. In Leviticus chapter 16, lots were cast over the two goats to see which one would be sacrificed and which one would be set free. In Joshua chapter 7, Achan's sin was exposed by casting lots. The serious nature of Achan's secret sin caused Israel to be defeated in battle by a small city. The land of Canaan was divided by Lot, and we see this in Numbers 26 and Joshua chapters 15 through 17. Jonathan, son of Saul, was detected by Lot as having violated his father's command, and this is in 1 Samuel chapter 14. King David divided the priests into divisions by Lot's in 1 Chronicles chapter 24. Then we read what Solomon wrote in Proverbs 16 verse 33. The Lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. We see from this that the Jews regarded the casting of lots as a solemn appeal for God's help in making difficult decisions. Yet the absence of this in the New Testament, except in this case, reveals that Jesus didn't teach his disciples to find his will for their life in this way. On the day of Pentecost, 120 disciples were baptized in the Holy Spirit. 
Jesus taught the disciples in John chapter 16, verse 13, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. The Holy Spirit would come to dwell in believers in two ways. First, he lives within everyone who truly surrenders their life to Christ and walks with him in genuine fellowship. The Lord told us in John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. The second way the Holy Spirit will indwell Christ's followers is through the second work of grace, which is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. This comes only to those who seek for the Spirit's infilling and by faith receive it with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Though this is available to every genuine believer, only those who ask, seek, and knock will receive it, for the Spirit's baptism must be sought after. When the Spirit lives inside of us, then we will have the one who will lead us into all truth. And there's no need for casting lots because we are called to ask, seek, and knock to get answers to prayer. I strongly believe that the way to be led by the Holy Spirit is through prayer and surrender. By casting lots, the apostles wouldn't have to make the hard decision of choosing between two men, which could have resulted in the one who wasn't chosen to be offended. After Matthias' appointment, we don't hear any more about him. But this really doesn't mean anything because most of the apostles aren't mentioned again either, so we don't want to make too much of this point. Church tradition tells us that Matthias became a missionary to Ethiopia and died there as a martyr. Now we come to Acts chapter 2. That's all about the initial outpouring of the baptism of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and the fruit that came out of that monumental day. Pentecost happens 50 days from the first day of unleavened bread, which is the day after the Passover lamb was offered. The law associated with this feast is found in Leviticus chapter 23. Acts chapter 2 verse 1 reads, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Now I want to read from the King James Version. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Not all translations present the idea that they were in one accord or in unity. Those translations that don't emphasize the unity instead focus upon the fact that they were all together at one time in one place. Though this is true, I think it's important that we don't minimize the role unity plays in an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It's a fact that the Holy Spirit won't descend in a congregation that is filled with division. Division is always evidence that some form of sin is working in a congregation and sin grieves the Spirit who is holy. Unity among the saints is extremely important and all those who want to see authentic revival must cultivate its biblical expression. In revival, the Holy Spirit is poured out to awaken the church so that the Spirit can move through the saints to see the lost radically saved in large numbers. Commentator Adam Clark, who is an expert in ancient languages, wrote on the importance of this unity in his commentary on Acts chapter 2, verse 1. I have slightly edited what he wrote for readability. He wrote, with one accord is a very expressive word. It signifies that all their minds, affections, desires, and wishes were concentrated in one object, Every man having the same end in view, and having but one desire, they had but one prayer to God, and every heart uttered it. There was no person uninterested, none unconcerned, none lukewarm. All were in earnest, and the Spirit of God came down to meet their united faith and prayer. When any assembly of God's people meet in the same Spirit, they may expect every blessing they need. Because of the power that comes through the Holy Spirit when the saints are unified, we can see why the devil is so aggressive at striving to cause division in a local church. Get the church folk fighting amongst themselves and the Holy Spirit will not be tangibly present in that congregation. This strategy is extremely effective and the hordes of hell have been using it for a very long time. The idea is simple. Get God's people to sin, then the Lord will fight against them. 
When the saints grow in grace and godly wisdom, they learn that their petty differences aren't worth grieving the Lord over. Then as they press in to know Christ more, they are unified as a result. Knowing Christ is either the solution or its absence the root problem. Whenever we take our eyes off of Jesus, we will put them upon ourselves, and this is sure to produce sin, division, and idolatry. But when we fix our eyes on Jesus, we get our eyes off of ourselves and each other, and this is extremely good. By pressing into Jesus, the unity we have with him will cause us to be unified with those who are also in hot pursuit after him. Those first disciples were in one accord, which means they were of one heart and one mind. They were passionately seeking after Jesus and the promised Holy Spirit. Why? because they believed that Jesus was right in saying that they absolutely needed the Spirit baptism before they did anything else. Do we believe that Jesus knew what he was talking about? Or do we think we know better than him and that the Spirit baptism is no longer needed today? We need to reevaluate this because this is very serious. Their seeking after God and the unity that came from it paid off in a spectacular way with their being the first people to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And the fruit of that baptism is seen in that over 3,000 people were added to the church that day. It's commonly thought that the 120 disciples were in the upper room praying on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit fell. However, some scholars assert that the outpouring of the Spirit actually happened in the temple. Let's look at both sides of this debate. Was the Spirit poured out in the upper room or in the temple? In the end, the evidence seems to favor the upper room, as we will see when we get into the second verse, but it's fun to investigate the possibilities anyway. The traditional idea is that the Spirit was poured out upon the 120 disciples while they were meeting in the upper room, which is possibly where Jesus had the Last Supper. To support this idea, we are told in Acts chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, that after they saw Jesus ascend into heaven, they returned to Jerusalem and went to the upper room. In verse 14, we are told that they all joined together constantly in prayer, but it's not clear where they met for prayer from this verse, though it seems to imply the upper room. It was probably in the upper room that Peter began the business meeting to appoint the successor to the empty apostolic position. Because the upper room seems to be the disciples' common meeting place, it appears that this was the principal place where they were praying for the promised Holy Spirit there's a good possibility that they did use the upper room as a place of prayer for the spirit baptism. One point in favor of the upper room being the location is that there were women in attendance that were baptized in the Holy Spirit. If the spirit fell in the temple, it would have complicated this, but that doesn't mean the spirit couldn't overcome such an obstacle. Yet when we read the account of the spirit descending upon those first disciples, we are told that the men were there, while there is no mention of women. This is typical of the biblical authors, and it doesn't mean that women weren't among them since they commonly didn't record the number of women in that day and culture. If the Spirit descended while the disciples met in the upper room, it may be that the women didn't go out into the streets while speaking in tongues. The culture of that day may have been prejudiced against women being so demonstrative in a public setting. The other option is that the women did go out into public speaking in tongues, but they aren't mentioned because that wouldn't have been proper. Guaranteed, when the Holy Spirit descended and baptized 120 disciples, it produced some serious excitement to say the least. Since it's rather clear that the 120 disciples included women, then we know that they were also baptized in the Holy Spirit, and this would support the idea that it began in the upper room. The second option is that the Spirit was poured out upon the disciples as they were praying in the temple during the morning sacrifice, which would have been at 9 a.m. The women weren't allowed in the men's court where the sacrifices took place, but there was a balcony in the women's court that allowed them to see the morning and evening sacrifices and be part of the prayers. If the Spirit descended in the men's court of the temple, then the women could have been partakers in the women's court, especially if they were praying from the balcony. The other option is that the men and women were praying in the women's court because it wasn't restricted to just women. That's where the offering boxes were located, and when Jesus sat in the temple watching people put in their offerings, it took place in the women's court, and this is why he saw the widow putting in her two mites. 
Those who assert that the Spirit was poured out in the temple support their claim by quoting those verses that show how the disciples regularly prayed in the temple. Let's begin with Luke chapter 24, verse 53, where we are told that after Jesus ascended into heaven, that the disciples stayed continually at the temple, praising God. This doesn't mean that they didn't leave the temple, but that they went there for the morning and evening sacrifices, which were the common times of prayer. Going on to Acts chapter 2, verses 46 and 47, we read, Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Dr. Luke made it very clear that the disciples went to the temple to pray, which would have been during the morning and evening sacrifice that were at 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. I don't want to diminish the importance of these public times of prayer and their need to seek the Lord for the spirit baptism that Jesus promised he would send. Yet I think they were also going to the temple to testify to Christ's resurrection. After the day of Pentecost, we are told in Acts chapter 3, verse 1, One day Peter and John were going to the temple at the time of prayer, at three in the afternoon. This shows that they kept up with the practice of going to the temple for the time of prayer, and in this account, it was during the evening sacrifice. This was an excellent opportunity for them to minister the gospel in the temple courts or porches that were more public. The account in Acts chapter 3 is about the Lord using Peter and John to heal a lame man that was begging at the gate beautiful. Let me give one more example of the disciples going to the temple for prayer, and we read in Acts chapter 5 verse 42, Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. Here we have clear evidence that the apostles and disciples used the temple as one of their venues for ministering the good news to those who would listen. From the verses we just looked at, we see that the temple was constantly used as a place of prayer, evangelism, and possibly discipleship. But was the temple the location where the baptism of the Holy Spirit was first poured out upon the disciples? At first glance, this would appear to be the easiest place to gather a large crowd of people that had to be well over 3,000, since that's the number who repented and turned to Jesus for salvation on that day. To this point, it would seem through circumstantial evidence that the temple was the location of the first Pentecostal outpouring. But everything changes when we look at the second verse, which we will do right now. Verse 2 declares that, Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. This verse settles the matter because we are told that the Holy Spirit filled the whole house where they were sitting. The word used for house simply means a house and doesn't refer to the temple. The argument of those who claim the Holy Spirit was poured out in the temple loses the debate in light of the obvious truth found in this verse. Though they went to the temple for the public times of prayer, the upper room was their principal meeting place. That's where they were praying, maybe even nonstop with the great expectation of receiving the promised Holy Spirit. Do you have that same excitement today? Are you seeking the baptism in the Holy Spirit like those first disciples did? If not, then why not? Thank you for listening to The Radical Truth with your host, Glenn Meldrum. We at In His Presence Ministries pray that this weekly podcast will be a blessing to you. Please tell others about it and subscribe yourself to this free podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at www.ihpministry.com. See you again next time, and may God richly bless you as you seek Him in spirit and in truth. And the thirst no more, so come wash in the river, come drink your fill. Let healing waters bear away your gift.